Alan. Hello, how's it going? Good, how, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great, great. Andy is walking out into the studio, getting set up. I'm gonna stay in the house. So I'm gonna give a little, when he has to come in from the studio, I'm gonna give a little introduction. Okay. So give him time to get in here. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so exactly, uh, we sort of, tell me how this is going. All right, so yeah, take, take it away, Andy. Take it away, okay. So what I'm demonstrating today is a tool called a straw arm. And we got this specifically because Virginia has problems with uh, tendonitis and she was having a hard time getting on the wheel and centering. So this tool is, is a helpful tool for centering. I wanted to explain some of the components. Um, hopefully you can see all this. It comes with a clamp and the clamp clamps to your wheel deck. And it has, uh, the, the manufacturer has specific clamps for specific wheels. So if you're using a, a Brent or a Bailey or uh, something other than a Shimpo, you can get a specific clamp mount for that. Really easy to install. It literally works exactly the way they describe it. It's a clamp. So there's a screw down here at the bottom. You just screw it up, make sure it's anchored to your, your uh, wheel deck and you're good to go. So the concept is you have a swing arm and there's a little bit of play in it. So you get it over your splash pan. But the swing arm has got a metal plate on it that helps you center it and it's simply using leverage from the, the fulcrum to, to come over and, and center the clay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the two pound piece so you can see how easy it works. The strong arm also comes with an opening tool and the opening tool is uh, flexible, moves ups and down, and it'll hit exactly the center of your piece when you're ready to go. And you can drop it to a specific depth. And that'll adjust for your foot height. And once you're in there, you can actually swing it one way or the other to open up your walls. Uh, works really well if you're doing something like a casserole. You can do it really quickly. Um, again, so you got the two components. You got the opening tool, and you got the centering plate. And these uh, these boards are actually made out of ash. I had originally thought about trying to make one myself because I saw a design online, but the best wood I could come up with on short notice was pine. I think this one's much prettier, so we'll stick with it. Uh, any questions so far? Does anybody have any questions? All right, well then I will move on. Um, I'm gonna put two pounds of clay on the wheel head, make sure that it's anchored really well. And then I'll, I'll make sure that uh, we get the strong arm going. And I've got it at two different angles, so you should be able to see two specific angles looking at it. My sponge here. And I've got right now uh, the angle from your left side highlighted, Andy. Uh, so if anyone else wants to look and see the other angle, uh, you can pull up the gallery view or you should be able to swipe through if you're on a phone, if you want to see that other angle. So again, all I've done is dropped two pounds of clay on the wheel head. I'm just pressing it down to make sure that I got a good adherence to the head. So I'm not pushing it off the wheel head when I start to center. Uh, and then again, the only difference between my centering by hand and, and using this tool is this tool tends to use a little bit more water than I like because you have to keep the, the, the plate here lubricated. But again, it's, it's just that simple. So I'm lubricating the plate and the clay here, moving it in. And you've got a nice center piece of clay. So you can see how quickly it works. And if you want a wheel wedge on the wheel, you can actually come back push it down a little bit and then come back in with your tool. Make sure it's lubricated, make sure your clay is lubricated. So this tool is really handy for folks like Virginia that have a little bit of a handicap on the wrist or folks that are just learning to throw and can't seem to get the set going. You could use this for, uh, for starting to learn to actually get a uh, piece of center quickly and then allow people to throw a piece that will actually let them make something so they're not spending all the time trying to center. And again, it's all, all about practice. Now you notice this is two pounds of clay. And of course you want to see if the strong arm could do more than two pounds. So what we can do is we can continue to add clay to it. And we can do it two pounds at a time. This is a, a wonderful trick, John Nelson. Uh, showed us when we were learning from him that you take small pieces of clay and you just add them together until you get more clay to work with. 
So I'm going to add another two pounds to this. Make sure that it's anchored really well. Give it a sponge. Make sure we've got a, a nice moist plate. And again, I'm going to come in from the side, see the moisture. And you see I'm braced up here on my, on my leg too, so I can use my leg in lots of leverage. And it's just a very fast, easy way to center clay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press this down and center it again a little bit with the plate and show you how the opening tool works. So again, we've got some lubrication here, again, on the, on the metal plate, come in. So we're centered. And you can see how quickly it works. You don't have to wrestle with it. You don't have to fight with it. You're good to go. I'm going to put just a little divot in here, make sure there's some water in there. And then I'm going to use the opening tool. And in this case, I'm going to lubricate the opening tool. It's got a little bit of dry clay on there. Make sure it's well lubricated, have a sponge handy. And again, it comes down and it goes right into the center of the piece. And again, I add a little bit of water and I push it down until it stops. And that has set my depth in the bottom. So I've got about five eighths of an inch. And then using my hand just to control the rim, I can pull it out. Again, just using a little bit of leverage. And you see how quickly and smoothly that opens? And you've got a really nice wall to work with. And again, you pick it up. And at this point, you can start throwing the piece. Again, I wanted to demonstrate this, just let people know that if you're having trouble centering and you want to throw on the wheel, there's, there's alternate ways of doing it. Um, this just seems to be a really good tool. And I think we'll be able to use it quite often to, to make really nice pieces. So that's that's pretty much it for the demonstration, unless you'd like to see it all over again. Is there any other questions? What I can provide for the grill, for the guild is the contact information for the company, which is Strong Tools. You can see it right here. I think you can see it right there. That way. Andy, is it expensive? It runs three hundred dollars. So that's expense is relative. I mean, some people have three hundred dollars they can spend. Some people don't. Um, it looks like it'd be really handy for faster production. If you're doing things like uh, platters and casseroles, you can knock them out in no, no time because you can adjust this. I think you can also set this up as a jig if you want to use a profile for a bowl. So I think this has 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 a, a lot of options you can work with. So you could use this for opening, switch this out really quickly. There's just a, a screw here to loosen it, it'll drop right out. You can drop in something that's a, sort of a center profile and work on the outside to, to do a profile for a bowl. So I think for, if you're doing mass produced pieces or like a dinner set, um, you, could, you could work really well with it. What's the- so how, long did it, how long did it take you to get comfortable with it? Oh, this is the second time I've used it, so pretty quickly. Well, I was about to ask what the largest piece of clay you put on there was, but if it's the second time, it might be this four pounds. Four pounds. But uh, if you go online, you can actually look for the strong arm tool online. YouTube, there's a, a lady that does a demonstration with 12 pounds. I think it's 12 or 13 pounds. And uh, it goes just as easy as what you just saw. It, uh, it's, it's very quick. It's very easy. It's comfortable. Uh, this clay, uh, I'm very thankful to Robert Escamilla. He donated the clay. Um, and when I do the, uh, the work with it, it's been sitting in the studio for a while, so it's a little stiff. And doing it by hand, it would have a little bit more difficult to center it. But with this tool, it was a breeze. It was really nice. So that, that's just a really quick demo. Um, Again, if, if you want more information, just email me and I'll send you everything I've got. Uh, it's fairly easy to find online. Again, it's the strong arm centering tool. There are other versions out there. Other companies make them. Uh, I found this one to be the most uh, compatible and their customer service is really good. If there's, uh, if there's no more questions, I'm going to uh, shut down my video out here and make my way I have one more question. Is it as straight on the inside as it is on the outside? Yes. Okay. Wow. So it's very good for doing uh, 
uniform wall thicknesses, especially if you're doing cylinders. Um, and that, you know, typically you'll have a, a flare out at the bottom when you're throwing by hand. Uh, so this, this will correct some of those things. Um, yeah, anything else? Andy, what have you been working on in the studio? Uh, I can give you a, a quick little tour. We've been doing a, a couple of different things. Uh, let me clean my hands a bit, and then I can grab the, uh, the iPad, and, and you'll have to forgive the jerkiness of the, of the movement. I'll try to move slow enough so the video will keep up. So our studio is, is, uh, is always a wreck because we're always doing something in the studio. So on the shelf here, you can see uh, several pieces, the, uh, the blue and, and turquoise pieces and the red piece on the far right were pieces were done as a commission. Uh, they're actually uh, ladybug themed pieces. The red and white ones are, are sandblasted and Virginia hand painted the, uh, the blue and turquoise ones. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer so you get some more detail. Again, please forgive the jerkiness of the video. So again, those are Virginia's pieces right there. These are some earlier works we had, uh, Virginia's pieces, and again, a sample of the sand blasting. There's a cat and mouse platter that we did for a show early on. And again, the ladybug themed bowl. Now we've also been working on some tree of life projects. You'll see we've got some work here. Virginia's doing a face and some flowers. I can't excuse the mess in the studio. It's a working studio. So a tree of life, uh, project. There's several of them we have going. So this first one is one that Virginia did all the painting on the ornaments and we're working to build a stand. It's going to be a multimedia piece. So there's going to be metal work in there and the base will actually be stone. Right now it's a foam, a foam piece. The little piece here in the background uh, is one that uh, uh, Cecilia Castro did. She came and she was doing a hand-built piece and, and uh, has a really good start on it. And she's going to make some ornaments that we can put on there. And then I wanted to do a monochrome piece. So I, I came back and this little candelabra is a monochrome piece. Uh, I enjoyed doing that one. I'll probably do some more. We were doing this as a preliminary for developing a class for the Southwest School of Art. I'm going to see if there's something we can do, Cecilia and I can do, that we can actually produce a video and do sort of an online tutorial. But the, uh, the Tree of Life projects is really fun. Just so you can see in the background, we actually have some of our, the masks that, that uh, we do. That's actually a face casting of Virginia and, and uh, an ornamentation there. So that's basically what we've got going right now. Um, is there any other questions? Hey, your studio looks great, though. It's not <laughs> dirty. <laughs> well, thank you. It, it's a... Uh, it's uh, been a, a bit of a mess <laughs> trying to straighten it up a bit for the videos. Anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop recording on this one and make my way inside. And then Virginia, I will talk about our collections and I'll set up a slideshow for you guys to view. Okay, now that Andy has shut down, I'm going to just talk to you guys a little bit, give you an introduction to what we're going to talk about, about collections. Um, Andy and I have been together about 33 years. We've been married 30 years. He had been doing ceramics for since he was in high school. I uh, got interested because I met Andy. I'd been doing artwork before that, different mediums. But I decided that I really liked what he was doing and I wanted to learn. So uh, he tried to teach me and you should never learn from your partner. So I went back to school. And I learned there. But anyway, we've been, so I've been doing it about 35 years or 33 years, I guess. And we, as far as collections go, we didn't intend to start a collection. Um, we just started with pieces that we love. We would see something and if you can afford it, if we could afford it, we purchased it. Um, and as we went along through our married life, we, our collection has grown and grown. Uh, many of the pieces come from our friends. Some of them we've traded with people, some we've purchased, some have been given to us. Um, we will go over all of that. We're gonna do a slideshow and you can ask any questions. Some of you have been in our home. 
you seen some of the things that we have? We're constantly, the question was, have we gotten anything new? We're constantly getting things new. We have too many things, <laughs> but we probably won't get rid of any of them because we love them all. Anyway, um, I'm not sure what I'm getting here on there, Alan. What am I getting? I'm sharing screen. Um, okay. Yeah, Andy's looks like he's, oh, you, you've got your, the share screen set up, so you're good to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on his way in. He's coming in right now. And I'm getting all kinds of feedback. <laughs> um, so if you turn this, turn the sound off on, on, on his device. So just, just crank the volume down. Okay, okay. <laughs> Technology, isn't it wonderful? That, sh that should be enough to do it. Okay. All right. There we go. Here we go now. All right. I was just telling everyone that we started when we were first together, then collecting things. We're still getting feedback on here, Alan. Yeah. It looks like he's muted. Um, I'm not sure why we're getting any feedback there. I don't know. <laughs> you can actually here. You can actually just dis disconnect his device if you don't need it anymore, because you're talking on yours. We don't. Do we need this anymore? We need it for the slideshow so we can see what we're doing. He's gonna try and, and mute it more. So. Okay. Yeah, it shows muted on my side, so you may have to just mute it on the device. Anyway, while he's doing that, I'll continue talking about it. Um, I would encourage everyone to maybe not have a collection. You may not intentionally have one, but start, start, take, start getting pieces that you love. It doesn't have to be an expensive piece. It doesn't have to be a famous piece. It can just be something that you love. And if you love it and you like it, buy it and keep it and display it. Also, Keep your own pieces. Um, we have a terrible habit of either selling or giving everything that we have away. We have kept some pieces that we don't want to get rid of that we uh, have grown to love. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, we're going to show you starting with starting with just what some of the collections we got and some of the what they're about, what we do. I'm just rattling on here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna uh, anyway, but I'm I'm just trying to tell you that what you should you should go with your passion. I think that's what it is. We're all ceramicists here. We all know what we love. We we work in different ways. We work in different styles. But just start if you want a collection, or if you're not if you're like us, we didn't even intend to start it. But just start with that one special piece. And I would encourage you, you know, this sounds kind of funny, but we can, when we were first together, we were so broke. We had both gone through a hard time, and so we didn't have any money. But we came across some pieces that I regret now we had not stretched a little bit. We still think about those pieces. So if you can, I, I don't want you to do something like, you know, not have food on the table or pay your rent. But if you can, stretch a little bit to get that special piece that, uh, that you saw. And don't regret that you lost that piece. So here's my husband, here he is. And I'll let him talk a little bit about it. Okay, well, if any of you have been to our, uh, our house, you know that everywhere you look, you see ceramics. And it's just because of our, our passion for the, for the art, the work, the material. It's so uh, enduring and, and durable. And, uh, and we just enjoy it, the beauty of it, and, and that the fact that it's been made by, by hand. So uh, again, we're gonna go through these. What you're looking at here is just a, a shelf of, of mixed work. And we're gonna look at these things closer as we go through the slideshow. Also, as we go through the slideshow, we wanna identify the artists who, who contributed to our collection. Uh, again, we're looking at these things because we're passionate about them and, and that we wanna support the people that actually do this work. 
Uh, it's, it's very important to us that we support local artists and artists that we meet on our travels. So in this particular photograph, you'll see a nice little ceramic bird right in the center of it. And that was produced by Linda Manning. Uh, Linda's a good friend and she's a partner of the Gallery 195 Gallery in, in, uh, in Bernie. And uh, the rest of the work around there is uh, older work from Virginia and I, uh, some Raku pieces, some slip cast pieces, and just some raw, some raw clay. One thing I'd like to say about this, if you look on the piece on the very far left and the very far right, those were done when I was in school. And because of those two pieces, I got a, a small scholarship. As I had entered them, uh, I had entered that and those and two other pieces and two other pieces, and was awarded a scholarship on it. So I was very proud of that. And again, Virginia mentioned that, that we like to keep some of our work, uh, especially the earlier stuff. So you can see how you evolve in your in your development with uh, with clay. Okay, this next collection is, is a collection of celadon. And, and we love the, the color of the celadon. We like the relief work. And, and a lot of these pieces were actually gifts from, from friends that, that travel a lot. So you see works from, from China and from Japan. And the three little pieces in the front are, are Indonesian pieces. And as you look at this set, there's, there's actually two of them that Virginia and I worked on. The, uh, the piece on the far left is a, is a, a little pot Virginia did with a bamboo pattern. And the clothes from up front up towards the right looks like an egg has it got a has got a frog on it. I don't know if you can see that detail very well, and that's one I did. So again, we collect these as we go through. There's several artists there that uh, these were purchased through different fundraising events. So we don't really know who the artists are. The the pieces were just available, but we like them significantly. As we as we collected, um, we have we tried. I've tried to put things together that I like and uh, that sort of go together. Anyway, the, what I'm trying to say here is this is a little collection of very small pieces that we have here, and you might recognize some of the pieces. There's one piece in here from Lucy Spring. There's one in here from John Nelson. Uh, Andy has, I have a piece that I made in there. Andy has two pieces that he's made in there. Uh, one in the very back is a friend of ours from Houston who uh, was one of the owners of uh, 18 Hands Gallery, which unfortunately is no longer there. And the other pieces, we have one in the very front was, uh, I can't pronounce her name. Hiseo. Hiseo McCluskey. Um, and it was very, it's a very tiny bit but these these are very miniature tiny pieces. So um, when the I had actually two pieces in that, I didn't realize that. And if you look at the collection, it's 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 important that as you start collecting pottery, you don't have to get the big stuff. You know, Correct. you can find exquisite little pieces. The one on the on the far left, the the little white piece with the floral pattern. We we got on a drive. We were headed up for Richmond, Virginia, and I think we were actually in in uh, North Carolina, close to Asheville. And there was a ceramic studio and we popped in and the guy was sitting there making these beautiful, beautiful pieces. And we just picked this one up as a silver mirror. So again, you don't have to go for the big stuff to enjoy and appreciate the work. This is a, is a sideboard. And again, it, it expresses a, a few different things for us. Uh, one is that, that we love the handmade work, but you can find beauty and the manufactured pieces too. So we have pieces that have been manufactured by various companies and, and they're, just, they're just exquisite pieces. They're well made and, and you can really appreciate them. Uh, this has got uh, quite a few different things in. I'm gonna let Virginia talk to you about what you're looking at here. Uh, in, this little, in this photograph, we've got on the, on the left is a piece of Roseville that I treasure very much, a uh, uh, teapot with the sugar and creamer. Uh, I have a very close, we have a very dear friend I've known for over 40 years and her mother, I knew her very well. And her, this was her mother's piece and she had it. And I always complimented and said, I really love this piece. And she said, she didn't like it. <laughs> and I said, well, I love it. So when her mother passed away, she gave me this piece and it always makes me think of them. The second piece, the little blue piece is a chocolate pot. That's from Switzerland. Uh, it was his mother, Andy's mother's piece actually. And the next one is uh, by a lady named Kim Bruce. 
She was a, few, uh, a friend of their family who lived in Canada. And we have several pieces by Kim, um, just exquisite and beautiful. And then here's this, this other little teapot. You can't really see that well, but it's by Gus McCluskey. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He and his wife were in, in uh, Bernie, but uh, they have since moved away. Here we go. In the left there, this little piece we picked up in Switzerland, in my, uh, in my, Andy's mother's hometown, it's just a very beautiful Swiss style with the little, um, the little handle, the handle that has a, a spoon that you can attach it to. Yeah, but, if, you, if you look at the spoon very carefully, you'll see that it's bent. It's got mm -hmm. a bend in the corner mm -hmm. that actually will hang off mm -hmm. the rim of the cup, which right. is kind of nice. And if you look at the handle, it's a throwing piece and then it's, it's cut. The rim is cut and then folded back as a handle. Mm -hmm. So it's a very unique way of doing a handle. And these pieces are manufactured pieces, but they're beautiful and the, mm -hmm. and the little tray is actually sculpted like a wave. So it's very dramatic. And the next piece is a teacup and saucer. I have a real, I love teacups and saucers. We do not show, I have a huge collection that I've collected and people given to me. Um, it's from Austria. And then we have an Irish piece, Belique. We probably, probably recognize that. And then here we have some more teacups. These are, are some that I collected. These are Italian. And then we have some mice and pieces that were given, that came down from Andy's family, from his grandmother. And then we have another little Irish piece on the right. Okay, this, this shelf is a, a small collection of works. And again, we talked about this earlier. We have uh, some of our earlier pieces. Uh, it's just so you can see the evolution of, of the work. Um, we do closed forms and then raku forms. The story about the raku forms is we don't do raku anymore. <laughs> we had a, a fairly interesting uh, and exciting incident when we did our last raku fire. And Alan, my older brother, Alan, uh, probably remembers it well. He was videoing our, our, uh, our firing and uh, Virginia was handling the reduction plot and I was doing moving the pieces from the, the kiln into the pot. I had put one piece in the kiln, Virginia had, had put the lid on. I was moving a second piece in and she picked the lid up. So the lid was in front of her face and my back was turned and there was a big flash. And I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I'm fine. Put the piece in the reduction kiln. She closed the lid and my older brother's a little freaked out. And then we looked at the video and we see a fireball that's about six feet in diameter flew in front of Virginia, but she had a shield with a garbage can mm -hmm. lid and it rolled over my back and didn't touch me. But I think that was the last time we fired. Yeah, I think group. that was it. <laughs> that was the last of our recruits. It was very, very exciting. Now these two pieces are, are uh, a little different. Mm -hmm. The uh, Martini Glass by, by Lotus, uh, she did that for a fundraiser in Houston for the Center, Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. They do a, 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 an event called Martini Madness. And you go there to support the craft center and, and you purchase a, a martini glass that's done by a local artist. And they're all very unique and different. Uh, we've contributed a number to that event. The, uh, the, the thing in the front, the <laughs> Folgers can, in case you're wondering, uh, I heard uh, talking about an urn earlier. We have a friend, Sarah Jackson, and Sarah Jackson had a, a corgi. His name was Bob Dylan Jackson. And he passed, so she came to us and asked to make an urn. And Virginia said, sure, we can do that. And then Sarah said, are you familiar with the movie The Big Lebowski? And of course we said, uh, yeah. No, we didn't, because Virginia was not <laughs> familiar with it. <laughs> anyway, she wanted a, a Folgers coffee can to put uh, Bob Dylan's ashes in. So I made a couple of them and let her pick the best ones. So that's actually porcelain with uh, mid-range fire glazes on it. It was an interesting project. Mm. I enjoyed it. Um, little note here. We were talking about the Center for Contemporary Craft in Houston. When this has lifted, or if you have an opportunity, they're not open right now. But when all of this is lifted and we can travel again, I encourage anyone who is in ceramics or any kind of contemporary craft to, to, to visit there. It's an absolutely amazing place to go. And they also uh, sponsor uh, the Empty Bowls in Houston. They don't sponsor it. They give us a place to have that, our event every year. No, I'm thing. sorry, Virginia. Can you tell us the name of that one more time? I'm sorry. The name of the place that you're recommending that we visit? 
this, this is a huge Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. Huh? Might be fun to organize a little field trip with the guild or something. It would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Like the, other, the other thing that uh, the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft offers, if you have the time, correct, they offer a, an internship. It can be two, four, six, eight month internship. It's a paid internship. It's not very much. You get a stipend for materials, but they give you a studio space and they expect you to be there for uh, three eight hour days during the week to show your work and how you do things. But it's a wonderful stepping stone to get mm -hmm. your work yes. out there. They are very supportive. You just have to find a way to, to house yourself while you're there, room and board sort of mm -hmm. thing. But it's well worth looking into. The only problem now because of COVID is they are not open to the public. Uh, when they are open, or you might be able, I don't know if they would do a special tour or not, but we could give you some contact information if you wanted to contact them and talk to them. Yeah, we. It, I think it'd be fun just to kind of have on the list for when things open up again. Oh, it is. It's a great place. And yeah. their, their staff is really wonderful there. And I think you would really enjoy going. All right. Our, thank phone, you. our phone is ringing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yes, I think you should put it on the list. It's definitely something. I did take two of our members, our our, our, I took uh, Cecilia Hancock and I took, um, just drew a blank, one of those senior moments, um, Maggie, Maggie. We were in Houston for, they were doing a workshop and I took them by and they were, they were really, they were very uh, impressed with it. So I encourage you to, to check it out. I'm back. Uh, okay, next slide is pieces that we actually have inherited uh, from my parents and, and there are, Italian, German, and Swiss pieces there. The piece on the, the right is, is one of our, our prized pieces in our collection. It's actually a terrain uh, that was created in Bern, Switzerland in 1794. Uh, I'm not sure what the significance of the date is. I know that, that four years after this pot was made, the French invaded Switzerland, uh, and, and there was a large, uh, I think it was an eight month battle before the Swiss booted them out. <laughs> Anyway, so that piece has been in our family, I know for at least five generations, if not longer, uh, and is a, is a, a very treasured piece. Now we get into some of the, the more contemporary work we have. Um, I'm gonna let Virginia talk about this one yeah. because it's, it's it has special meaning to it. This has a lot, this is a very special meaning to me. Uh, Roy Haskam was my teacher uh, and I guess sort of my mentor. He encouraged me and taught me a lot, a whole lot of things. But these, both of these pieces are, this is clay. If, you're, if you've been in our home, it's very large. I would say how tall, maybe. It's about three feet by five feet. Yeah, about three feet by five feet. It's actually eight sections. It has uh, some blocks of wood embedded and it's coils. It's just coils. It looks like metal. If you're looking at it, of course, it's like metal. The, the piece on the right is also his. But the piece on the left, uh, I fell in love with, I absolutely fell in love with. He did a show at 18 Hands in Houston when it was open and I wanted it, but it was very expensive. And I told Roy, I said, you know, he says, well, I have some little ones. I said, no, I want a big one. So what happened is about two years later, Roy gave me a call and he said, do you still want one of those pieces? And I went, yes. And he said, well, I have three left, I'll let you have one for. And it was just a fraction of what he was charging. So it took me about 30 minutes to get to his house. And, <laughs> and so it's mine now, or ours now. But he is an amazing man. He teaches uh, at uh, Lone Star College in Houston. And he's, you can see him. Unfortunately, the Clay Festival will not be happening this year, but he's always there. And he contributes to many a uh, charity functions in Houston, so I encourage you to look him up. His name is Roy Haskam, but, and he does a diverse work of, of pieces. So I love, I love his work, and he means a lot to me. So well, this is a, another one of Roy's pieces, and, and this is more of his more recent work. Uh, we actually picked this one up at another fundraiser. Um, a lot of the work we get is from fundraisers. If you look at the the one on the, on the right in the back, the black and gold one, was done by a, a Swiss lady named Catherine Winkler. She actually was in Houston for a, quite a while. 
and she she did a number of ceramics, but but she also did a traditional uh, Swiss uh, work as, as a uh, paper cut. So she will actually make uh, fine art objects and, and uh, prints from paper cuts. But we love the piece and we picked that up at an Empty Bowls event, as we did with the one that's in the far front by Libby Deliria, the, the sort of fluted bowl. And then again, there's another Roy Haskell piece there. All of those were, were purchased at, at an Empty Bowls fundraiser in Houston. And this is some more of Libby's work. She initially started out making these beautiful pieces of branches and stones. Uh, and they were so realistic, people weren't purchasing them because they looked like trees and rocks. So what she started doing is she started embellishing them with little, little details that made it obvious that it was clay. Uh, and they're just beautiful, beautiful pieces. Again, the bowl on the right was uh, purchased at an uh, empty bowl's fundraiser. This, this uh, shot, I wanted to show you the, the overall shot. Uh, so you can see how that's arranged in our house. And Lucy was asking earlier if we have any new mm -hmm. stuff in the house. And this is some of the newer work. Um, the, the piece on, on, on this slide on the left that's on the bottom was done by Tom Perry. Tom Perry is a dear friend. And he's the one that actually introduced us to the Empty Bowls event in Houston 14 years ago. And as part of Enseca, when, when Enseca was in Houston in 2013, he did a series of these ceramic bells to give you a, a sense of proportion. This thing is approximately 20 inches tall and, and it has some really nice detail on it. And we just love the bell, it's, it's wonderful. And then we have another friend, our friend Mark Rosenthal. We met in, in Las Vegas at an at a opening Virginia was participating in. And they have Rosenthal's Mark and Mary have moved to uh, this area and they actually have about four miles from us. He had this piece in his studio and I fell in love with it. I thought it was an amazing piece. And uh, Virginia actually surprised me by getting it for me for Father's Day. And the two pieces are just so complimentary. And, and uh, again, these works are, are works that we picked up because we're just passionate about the, the work, but also the people that produce them. Mark was one of the people that entered the jury show last year. That is correct. Yes, he is. He is. He is, and he, uh, he does some amazing, he is, his studio is very interesting too. If we ever do another studio tour in this area, it would be good to see his studio also. Uh, this piece is by Jeff Forster. This was a, a piece that we bid on. It's a, there's a gallery in Houston we belong to for a number of years, uh, Archway Gallery, and they always, they partnered with Empty Bowls to do an online auction, a silent auction that will have an opening. Well, this piece was done by Jeff Forster. Jeff Forster is head of the ceramics department at Glassell School in Houston. Another place, if you're in Houston, would be well worth going to see. But it is a double wall piece closed in and they, it's just amazing. I love it. It's fairly large. How long do you think that? Do you think that is? It's, it's, probably, it's probably about 14 inches in diameter yeah. and eight inches tall. Yeah. Uh, but again, these, these are, are wonderful pieces that mm -hmm. we, we picked up uh, along the way. This, uh, this piece is by Maria Gould. I think Maria has, uh, hey Maria, I think you've logged in. Um, this, this was one that we fell in love with in the show that we were doing out towards Kerrville. And uh, it was a bug themed or insect themed <laughs> show. And we fell in love with it. We were talking with Maria and, and we came uh, to this one. We own this one because we did a wonderful trade. Uh, the trade was, uh, was quite a deal. I think we came ahead and I, I think, think so. Maria <laughs> said she felt like she came ahead. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this is a, a four tile piece and, and uh, it's meant to, to mount on the wall. We have it laying on a table. We like it like that, but we're thinking about maybe uh, migrating it to a wall place. We've got a, a new place for it, but we, we absolutely love the piece. This How piece. Big, go back to the, the um, insects on the tiles. How, how big is that? So the tiles themselves are about eight inches. Uh, so overall, uh, it's about uh, 32 inches um, by eight inches. It's amazing. Just uh, think how much fun your teenagers would finally respect <laughs> your collection if you had a bunch of those or something. <laughs> well, you'll notice the detail on it is phenomenal. And Maria works with 
uh, underglazes that don't have uh, any kind of a, a clear coat. So it's just pure underglaze. So you get that wonderful matte and satin finish. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful piece. Yeah, these pieces come from two of our members. We have Norma Delicator on the left. This is another piece that we traded for uh, when she was making this piece. And when we saw it, uh, it was actually in a show that we sponsored. If I don't know if some of you remember it. Uh, we decided we wanted to have a show because we're so passionate about 3D art. We feel that it is undervalued. The people don't consider it fine art. So what we did is we sponsored a, a show and invited artists that we know that are 3D artists uh, from all over Texas. And Norma was one of our artists in that show. And she had this piece. And so she'd had it for a while and we finally talked her into trading for it. And the piece on the right, I think you probably, the old time members know who made this piece. This is by Cecilia. Uh, Hancock and it is a, she does storytelling with her pieces and I think you would I'm sure you, if you haven't seen her pieces they're just amazing in her home she has some just incredible pieces we was one of our first purchases when we came to San Antonio at the very first show that we entered with the guild and so we just fell in love with it and we purchased this piece yeah, I wanted to make a comment about Norma's work. Uh, Norma mm -hmm. does a sketchbook. In, in her sketchbook, oh, yeah. she will draw these pieces, and they are drawn in such phenomenal detail. And she always starts with the sketch mm -hmm. and then builds the piece afterwards. And they are always a perfect match. I'm always mm -hmm. amazed yeah, by her she, work. Yeah, she's amazing. And of course, you know, Cecilia's uh, working with me to do the Tree of Life projects, and she's such an incredible inspiration. Okay, here we go. Here we have some pieces by uh, a member that's no longer with us, not, not dead, but <laughs> has moved away. <laughs> Inez Walker, we miss her a lot. And uh, this was another piece that she was so thrilled that we, on the, on the left, that we purchased from her and she couldn't believe we bought it, but I thought it was just an amazing piece. And Lucy, I know you're there. And uh, those little houses are Lucy's and they're just, they're just, amazing little precious pieces and we had to have them. Inez also made this piece that's on top. She was in our show, the show that we had. It was called, uh, the name of the show was Art in Three Dimensions and we had invited her and she had a piece in our show we wanted desperately that she had already promised it to someone else. So she gave us this, this lovely little piece. And the piece on the bottom was done by Liz Collins. She's a, an artist that is at uh, uh, in Houston at the uh, Archway Gallery. And this is actually glass work, but the, the set went together so well, we just felt it, it belonged together. Mm -hmm. on, on that, and, the, and this piece is on, on the left. That piece is actually a double wall mm -hmm. piece. Uh, and, and it looks very heavy, but it's not. It's a very light piece. And the texture pattern is just absolutely amazing. This, these pieces are done by an artist that lives in Sugarland now. He was in Houston for the longest time, Albert Goldrich. And, and Albert is an interesting fellow from South Africa. He uh, works, had originally worked with these, these sort of tribal patterns uh, that we really appreciated. The, uh, he switched to glass and he's been doing a lot of glass work and he's slowly migrating back to ceramics. Albert's interesting in that he actually holds a world record mm -hmm. for the longest pottery marathon by an individual uh, over the age of 70. He actually did it as an empty bowls event and he threw continuously nonstop for 18 hours and three minutes. He had the support of a ceramic store in Houston who provided the clay. He had support of a number of schools. The glass sale school was doing the wedging and giving him the balls of clay. Mm -hmm. uh, they set up two wheels in the 18 hand gallery and there was uh, food support water. He could take like a two minute break every 30 or 40 bowls or whatever it was. And then uh, he sat down and he started doing it. It was an amazing process. It was, he was amazing. Anyway, we cherish these pieces along with the memory of being there watching make that world record. Okay, this is a, I'm sure you're familiar with these pieces. Uh, Lynn Bellal was one of the people who did a program. And these are her pieces. And she's incorporated uh, some ceramic faces into her, 
um, found art, had found object and in assemblages. And uh, we truly, I fell in love when we met, we met Lynn through uh, the guild when we went to a workshop that she gave. We've become friends with her and we have a number of her pieces. Uh, truly love what she does, how she puts them together. So ceramics don't have to be a bowl, a plate, even though, you know, it doesn't have to be functional. It can be incorporated into other things. So, you know, think about what you're doing. We all have what we like to do best, but uh, Lynn has incorporated these into just something that just, I don't know, I, I get very emotional about her pieces. I think they're just amazing. So the one on the on the right is is a uh, spirit doll, and and the one on the left is uh, a face pressing that she does. And the little faces, she's actually collected them by going and making uh, press molds of uh, cherubs in mm -hmm. cemeteries, which I thought was a really great idea. But again, mixed media uh, ceramic is so flexible you can incorporate it into just about anything. I want to talk a little bit about Dan Hammett. He was actually one of the jurors for the, the San Antonio Potter Guild annual member show. And, and it was one uh, Virginia and I helped organize and we arranged for Dan to, uh, to be the juror. We met him in Houston at a Clay Houston event and, and asked him to, uh, to be the juror and he would kindly uh, accept it. And he came to, to stay with us for three days while he was doing that. So one of the pieces we actually purchased from him uh, and, and really appreciated work. The other was a gift sort of uh, uh, for putting him up for three days while he was here. But his work is amazing. He is actually, uh, he wasn't, he's retired now, mm -hmm. but he was an instructor at the University of Dallas uh, and uh, a phenomenal potter and really knowledgeable, knowledgeable person. He is a wonderful resource for almost any question you might have on ceramics. He's another artist that usually does the clay festival. Like I said, unfortunately, this year the Clay Festival has been canceled because of the COVID. So, but I'm sure they'll all be back. If you come to our house, um, people think we're a little bit religious, but we just like the mm -hmm. symbology, um, you know. And, and Lucy will will understand this because she sees some of the things. But Rosie Escamilla, uh, a good good friend of ours, uh, does these these cruciform pieces. And, and a lot of times I'll see them and she downplays them. Oh, they're not good. They're not this, they're not that. And they're just absolutely marvelous pieces. Both of these are about eight inches tall mm -hmm. and about uh, six to seven inches wide. The one on the right with the, the yellow Madonna and child, uh, initially that, that image was uh, like a photograph and something in the chemistry uh, caused it to, to yellow like that. And it's just a stunning piece. And she does, she does amazing work and always uh, disparages her own work and, and uh, should, she should be. I'd like to say something about Rosie too. <laughs> particularly the one on the left. She was going to discard this piece. And I said, no, no, you're not gonna throw that piece away. And she, says, so she said, do you want it? And I said, absolutely. And she gave that to us. So she's given us both the pieces, but she does downplay her work. Uh, don't ever do that to your work. Please don't. <laughs> And this is uh, Rosie's husband, Robert. And I think we all know Robert fairly well. Rosie and Robert own a, a studio on, on uh, Blanco Street in San Antonio and, and uh, Potter's Guild uh, at one time met there quite frequently. The, the bowl you see is, is a, a sort of a, a collaborative work. Um, I've, I've been making these hump molds for the wheel that you can create bowls using slabs and I gave one of the hump molds to Robert to work with. And this is one of his first pieces off that, that hump mold. And it's, it's amazing the way he got the glaze to, to pattern on there. He makes his own brushes for doing the brush work. And it shows, I mean, it's just amazing work. He also does the cruciform pieces. These are Raku fired and have a, a peach pit texture to them. Uh, I've got several of these and I absolutely love them. And then the bowl on the, the right is, is what he did, experimenting with some, some different kinds of glazes. But both Robert and Rosie do, do amazing work and really appreciate them as friends. Oh, this is, oh, where, excuse me. <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay, we're looking at some pieces here that we've, actually that one in the back, it says Virginia Valley on it. It was when I was taking my very first ceramics class and it, we had to do something, you know, just 
come up with something just out of our heads. And this is what I came up with. So just keep that in mind. It was one of my very first pieces. The piece on the left at the bottom is Kelly, I never can't pronounce it, Agret, a, a talented, talented artist. She has made some amazing pieces that are just out of this world, sort of, uh, I'm not what you, what you would call them. But she was, I was very fortunate enough to go. She taught, she gave me some private lessons and I, I, and she gave this piece to us in appreciation for being in a show, I think, yes. that we had done. Yes. So that, that came. And then the next piece over is one of uh, the early pieces when Andy, whoops, oh, there sorry. you go, there you go. Let's see if I can get us back. <laughs> Way far. There, there you go. go. The little piece with the, the, the turquoise on was one that Andy did when we first met. When it's actually a Rakud piece. The, the, the piece wasn't actually Rakud, but the glaze is a Rakud glaze. Mm -hmm. so, oh, that's right. So that's, that's, that's done in an electric kiln. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, gl the glaze itself was mm -hmm. one that was manufactured mm -hmm. by the ceramic mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. They made the mix. I don't think they make it anymore. But when you would fire it to cone five, it would get those wonderful greens and blues. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And that was by accident. I just, yeah. I slipped that piece in the kiln. Yeah. I, I thought that mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a normal glaze and it actually was a Roku piece. But, uh, and then the one on the right is uh, by an artist, Michelle Matthews. She's a past president of uh, Clay Houston. Mm -hmm. And she's a very organic pieces. I don't think Virginia likes this one, but I do. <laughs> I don't dislike it. It's just not my favorite. <laughs> well, this is, a, uh, this, it's a piece by Harding Black. Um, I'm not, it was, he's a mid-century modern uh, ceramicist. And I was fortunate enough to win this piece. I never win anything. <laughs> and I was making a big deal about it. It was uh, at um, the Art League. They were having a dual uh, show, or a mid-century modern show. And this was the door prize. And I was making a big noise about never winning anything. And every that says, oh, sign up, sign up. And so I was sure I would not win anything, and well, I did. And it's, I'm very, I think it's just a beautiful piece, and I love it. Um, so always enter, I guess. <laughs> I guess yeah, and again, I think most of you are familiar with Harding Black. He's a San Antonio potter. It was, was very prevalent in the 50s and 60s, and, and uh, so this is one of his earlier pieces. Uh, you know, where we talk about uh, collecting, a lot of people want to collect for an investment, and, and we don't do that. We, we get what we're passionate about. Uh, but some of these pieces do have value, and, mm -hmm. and this little Harding Black Bowl is probably about uh, five and a half inches in diameter, uh, maybe three inches tall, and, and it has a value of about $450. So there is some value in some of the work we have, but that's not why we buy it. We buy it because we love mm -hmm. the work, or in this case, Virginia, <laughs> Virginia Struck Gold. Yeah, this one, <laughs> we, we won this one, so that's okay. And the piece on the right is a, is a cup uh, by Blake Kennedy. I think most of you know Blake. He's at the Southwest School of Art. He's an incredible young man, uh, extremely talented, very knowledgeable, and he's super generous with his time and, and knowledge. And I wanted to, to you know put a shout out for Blake because he's such a great guy. We love this little mug. We got this online. He has a new uh, online store, uh, well worth visiting. He does things that move up fairly quickly. Uh, but again, very, very proud to own a Blake Kennedy piece. These pieces, we're doing a little transition here. So most of the pieces you've seen up until now have been more or less um, pieces to be appreciated as, as artwork that you put on the shelf and, and admire. And then we get into this, this area of, of truly functional pieces. Um, the pieces on the, the left were done by Ray Morales. Again, empty bowls, I'm sure you're getting tired of us pushing empty bowls, but these were empty bowls, San Antonio works. Uh, we use these bowls every single day. Uh, we have them for breakfast or we'll, we'll mix something in them, but we use them every single day. And the, and the bowls on the right, Dudley Harris bowls, I'm sure you all know Dudley. These were all purchased through uh, the uh, event Dudley holds in this, uh, as a fundraiser for, for Texas Public Radio and for Planned Parenthood. And every year he does this wonderful sale. These, these bulls are very inexpensive and extremely functional. Again, we use these things every single day. These, uh, the, the bulls you're seeing of Dudley Harris's are just a very small portion of what we have. And we do use them. I have my, our bulls. 
I encourage you, he has twice a year, um, he has a sale and he will put out a notice. He is a member of the Potter's Guild and he makes these amazing, beautiful, functional bowls. And he has a sale and he sells them for nothing. But he charges nothing for this. But many of you are familiar with it and go to his sales. And I don't know how many times we bought uh, sets to give as gifts to friends, but I have, we have cabinets full of them and I use them all the time. I spoke with Dudley uh, just at FYI uh, the other day and he fires his kiln getting ready for, for his uh, December sale uh, a couple of times a week. So um, he is uh, totally in, in production. Well, that's great, John. I'm glad to hear that he's having the sale. I was not sure whether he would or not. That's fantastic to hear. Uh, this, these uh, pieces here are uh, uh, done by Kim Bruce, again, a Canadian artist that was a friend of, of my parents. And, and we sort of inherited these three pieces, they're nested bowls, and, and then we use them for everyday stuff. We mix things, we serve things in them, we present things in them. Kim has a, an interesting uh, history. As, this, as potters and ceramicists, we know it's difficult, difficult to make a living doing, uh, doing our artwork. And what Kim would do to, to fund her studio, to, to make money to pay for supplies, is she would go to the horse races and she would gamble and she was phenomenally successful at it. So she, <laughs> she maintained her pottery and studio for, for quite a while. She finally retired to uh, uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island. The ones on the right are again, uh, Lotus Bermudas. These are again purchased at, at uh, Empty Bowls and we use these again every single day um, and we treasure them. There was four, but I broke one. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Now this this uh, shelf is is uh, basically a, a small, well small. It's most of our, our Marco teas and Custis Grande uh, pottery. We fell in love with the uh, the artwork and and have collected them for years and years and years. And I think the first time we purchased a, a Marco Ortiz piece, we were in Santa Fe with my older brother and his his then wife, and and we were at the flea market up by the, the Opera House in Santa Fe. And uh, I was standing here looking at some obscure stuff and all of a sudden my sister-in-law at that time, she comes running up to me and goes, Andy, 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 Virginia needs you now. And I ran across the flea market to Virginia and she's standing in front of a table of these, these pieces. And she says, we need to get some of these. And I'm looking at them going, they're beautiful. I said, they're wonderful. And, and we asked the guy how much, and he was giving them away dirt cheap flea market prices. $30 a piece, folks. So we, I think we wound up buying six of them and we gave four of them away. Um, but he actually would drive down to Mato Ortiz and he would purchase them directly from the artist. This had to be 20, five years 25 ago. years ago. 25 years ago. And we've been collecting them ever since. So each one of those has a story. Uh, each one of those was done on a different trip to New Mexico or farther. Uh, when we travel through Santa Fe or Taos, we'll, we'll stop and we'll find people that, that have these wonderful works. Now, the one work in there that is not a uh, Mato Ortiz piece is a, uh, is a Peter Masters piece, which mm -hmm. is on the far right on the bottom with the, the glass. If people want to talk to us about Peter Masters, we will. Uh, but that's a long, long story, and no, we don't have time for it now. Well, I will say one thing about Peter. He's He's certifiably crazy, so we'd be happy to talk about him sometime. But he is a talented, talented person. So again, these pieces are, are the Mato Ortiz pieces. The ones on the left were collected at three different trips, uh, at three different locations in Santa Fe. And, and I love the checkered patterns, and I love what they do with the tops of their pieces. So you look at the rims, and you can see that the variations in there is, is phenomenal, and it gives you inspiration for your own work. The piece on the, the right, we really treasure that piece. That was done by Jorge Quintana. He came to San Antonio uh, and he was at uh, Mission Jose. San Jose. The, San Jose, I'm sorry. The, uh, the Mexican art show and, and market. And he was doing demonstrations and this is one of the pieces in his collection that he had for sale. And we, we purchased it and, and, and we just absolutely love it. It's a wonderful piece. Now, while he was there, he was doing a, a demonstration and the piece on the right there that, that has his name, 
he did that demonstration at the at the mission, and that was the piece that they pulled out of the out of the fire, and he had it sitting on the table as, you know, here's here's what we do, and that's that's the piece that comes out, and we just asked him. I said, "Is that one for sale?" And he said, "Sure." <laughs> so we brought it home. It's just exquisite, and the one on the the left, the uh, Mariano, Casada, she shows in a number of places in, in Santa Fe, and uh, I love her work. Very contemporary. Uh, again, ins inspirational as far as what you can do with clay. And again, these are all, all low fired pieces, um, burnished, hand burnished and painted. They're just, they're wonderful. One, one note on this, you know, we were talking about, I was so excited when I saw these pieces, first saw them at this flea market. I looked at them and I just immediately went, these are special pieces. And we bought, like Andy said, we bought four and we started purchasing at the flea market over the years. And But this is, what I'm telling you, when I'm saying if you love a piece, buy it. We didn't buy it intentionally to collect them, but we just love them so much. And now this collection is worth quite a bit of money, starting out at $30 for a pot. And now, so your collection, if you get something you really love, doesn't mean, it, I mean, it means it, I'm, I'm being, I'm babbling here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's not necessary to buy to increase the amount or the cost or the value. value, thank you, of your collection. But sometimes if you things see things that you truly love and recognize as beautiful pieces, that eventually they may become very valuable. And in case you're wondering, the little figurine in the, in the front on the right, is, that's a Virginia piece. Again, some more of the, the collection. You can see that we have quite a variation. We love the, the wedding jars and the, the, the melon fluted pieces. Uh, they're all exquisite. You'll notice on the bottom, we have one Hopi pot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was mine. I had to have that pause. I just fell absolutely in love with these. I love the, the work of the Hopis, but um, unfortunately I can't afford very many of them. <laughs> this one happened to be on sale, but I think it's, it was during uh, Indian market, I think. And if you ever want to go to Indian market in Santa Fe, you have the time and the money, they usually bring down everything at least half price. At, after the, the market's done, you can yeah. get some real bargains. Yeah. Again, we wanted to talk a little bit about our, our artwork and, and the collection. We noticed last time we went to Dudley's uh, studio that he had a lot of his work out in the yard. And we do too. And it's something to keep in mind, you know, if you have pieces that you really love and, and you want to show them to folks, you know, put them in your yard. People get a, a chance to look at them. So this is out on our back deck. These are Virginia pieces. Um, and they just go so well with what we've got going on on our, on our back deck. Uh, the next slide is pieces of, of work that, that we've done over time. Uh, these are mostly my pieces. The ones on the left were done at the Southwest School of Art in, in one of Cecilia Hancock's classes. The ones on the right are little stone spirits uh, that I put together and, and uh, really enjoy those too, but they're sitting in our front yard. We also want to talk a little bit about face casting. It's something that we do and enjoy. Uh, we did a demonstration for the Potter School a number of years ago, and we we're Willing to do it again, we just have to, to find the right time and a, and a victim, I mean, somebody to volunteer to, uh, to have their face cast. If you look at these, the, the face on the left is actually Virginia's face. Uh, and then she did the assemblage of, of uh, coral and shells. The glass in the back is uh, etched glass, and it's something we both work on design-wise and then sandblast. The piece on the, uh, on the right is a, a face casting of myself. Uh, that Virginia did of me, and then again, send them to some glass. But again, we could talk to the, the various skilled folks and maybe we can do another face casting. Video. I think we have a couple of people that may be on with us right now, at least one, Lucy, who was uh, in a workshop with us and she's used her, her uh, casting or her um, mold a number of times now. You can actually see it on the Tree of Life at uh, uh, mission is mission Spada. Espada or Mission San Francisco de Espada. And on that one, there's there's a number of face castings. I think Cecilia Hancock actually has her face up there too. Yeah. As, as does Virginia and myself. And we want to talk <laughs> about our art truck, right? So this is this is something that's an ongoing project. We've had to be going now for five years. Uh, it has been in the Houston Art Car Parade uh, three times. 
And what we're doing is we're, we initially did it as a, as a project with uh, Archway Gallery in Houston, celebrating their 40th year in business as, as a Texas uh, artist owned uh, gallery. And we had a number of people contribute to it and, and add things to it. But since then, people we have taken a few things off and we've added more and more clay object to it. And the concept of the art truck or art car is to be able to take your artwork to the public. So you can take your art, you can drive it down the street, people can see what you're working on. We drive this truck every week we take it somewhere and every week we get phenomenal responses from it. And you can see if you look at it, some of the details, uh, we've got little ceramic heads on it. We've got, that's Virginia's face again. Uh, we've got vinyl, we've got glass, we've got paint. And it's just a real joy to, to take it and, and let people see what the artwork is. And we always get a thumbs up or, or if somebody wants to take a picture of it. I'll have to say again, we keep talking about Houston. Let's go where we're from. We've been here for nine years now. We retired here. And so uh, we we're, in, were involved there in Clay, uh, in Clay Houston and the, art, um, the, the empty bowls for 14 years. And the, we have been in the art car parade five, five, five times, total, total, total of five times. And here's another thing. If you have never heard it, never seen it, it is worth a trip to Houston to see this. You usually have it in May. And it's just, I think we, this was their 30, 33rd. 33rd year this last year, unfortunately, because of COVID, we didn't get to do it this year. But it is an amazing event. And if you ever get a chance to go, go. You will truly, truly enjoy it. They have over 250, like last time was 280 vehicles that are done up and most of them are like this, but they can also uh, also be uh, low riders or they can be classic cars or they can be anything. They even have kids on, on, on done up bicycles, which are great. It's a huge event. It's a lot of fun to go to. And in closing, <laughs> one of the things we want to talk about is that uh, ceramic passion and ceramic ability are not genetic. <laughs> Uh, our youngest son, none of, we have three sons, none of them are interested in ceramics. Um, our youngest son did this in middle school. It's a, it's a rhinoceros and it's, it's a part of our collection also. Yeah, it is part of our collection. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll sit here and answer questions. If well, I, would, questions. I would like to say something. Uh, I was saying we moved here nine years ago. I can't believe it's already been nine years. We moved here knowing no one. Uh, coming from Houston, I'm a native Houstonian. Andy was there for ever. ever. <laughs> and we had so many friends and family there. And uh, so we didn't really know how we would adjust here. We joined the Guild. And I would have to say that through the Guild, we have made some amazing, wonderful friends. Uh, we cherish them. We cherish the fact that we've been able to be with them and, and get to know them. Uh, in, I can't say enough about community and about the community of ceramics and art, any kind of artwork. So I want to thank the Guild particularly for taking us in and being our friend and being very close to us. So thank you all so much. And thank you for the opportunity for letting us show you our collection. I would think that you all give so much that that's why you get taken in and make so many friends because you contribute all the time. Well, I'll tell you a little bit, a story about the COVID. We do and we enjoy everything we do. Um, the problem was we were becoming too involved with too many things and we were beginning to be a little burned out. And before all this hit, we had sat down together and talked it over and said, we need to back off. We need to slow down. Well, <laughs> the COVID came and there you go. So we have slowed down. But ceramics has been something that has kept us going, uh, kept us um, in, 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 in engaged and doing things. We actually had some uh, commissions that we had been putting off. So we got those finished and we we're doing projects. So that's been sort of a lifesaver for us. I mean, where we live, we're, we feel completely fortunate to be where we are and the fact that we are together. And I guess that's another thing that people are always uh, interested in 
is that we are collaborative artists. Almost every piece that you see that we do, that we do is touched by both of us in some way or another. So we are collaborative artists and we have been working together like this for 25 years? 30 years. <laughs> well, no, 25 years and people, I don't find it amazing. We're very fortunate, we're so compatible. We have the same passions, we have the same interests and we get along so well, so far. <laughs> we'll see after all this about COVID. <laughs> but we do we get along very well right now and people are amazed by it. And I just think we're fortunate that we can do that. So if you have any questions, Far away. I, I commend you with your program that you put together. Um, you've spent a lot of time taking those pictures and getting them, getting them ready to go. I can tell. So it, it's beautiful, beautiful presentation. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, John. And you've noticed that you were one of our artists here. So yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We're so grateful to have you in San Antonio, guys. You, like Jill said, you give so much of your time and your, your knowledge. It's just, um, we needed that shot in the arm when y'all came down and we appreciate it so much. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. And you've become a wonderful friend to us and we appreciate you too. Yeah, and we expect a studio tour as soon as you finish, Lucy. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Yeah. Don't hold your breath just yet. Oh. With Zoom, we don't even have to drive out there. Right. We so, have to drive there. But I've been looking at all the pictures. It's going to be an amazing studio. That's so it's are there tiny. Other, are there other questions of the valleys? If not, this I want great, to tell you about the next two programs. Um, I was just going to say real quick, the. There's also some comments in there. So Andy, Virginia, if you want to look through the comments, there are some comments about the program there too. So uh, all, all very positive comments. So thanks so much for showing the presentation and, and showing thanks. us how, how you can put, put everything together in your house. I feel like I run out of space all the time. <laughs> oh, we're believing that we have run totally out of space and we say, okay, we don't need anything else, but we no, always fall in love with it. Does not stop us. I always have people say, well, what are you going to do with that? Where are you going to put that? And what my answer is, I'll find a place where it's going to live. And I'll live with it for a while. And after a while, I find that place where it's going to live in my house. So you, know, you can't have too much, I guess. Well, the, the other thing you have to keep in mind is Virginia is constantly rearranging. <laughs> so the story, the story I like to tell is at Christmas time, we decorate the tree. And I, I join in every year. I decorate like crazy. And I know that when we're done, Virginia's going to rearrange all the pieces. <laughs> uh, she, does, she does the same thing in the house. The artwork is never in the same spot twice. So uh, well, it, that's not true. It, so makes it, it makes it fresh and, and exciting every day. <laughs> I love it. I love in San Antonio, we, we really didn't touch on that too. We've collected so many pieces, uh, um, Hispanic and Mexican pieces that we love, love, love. We found so many beautiful pieces here. And yeah, you, you saw probably about two, two thirds of our collection. Yeah. yeah. So. If you come out to visit sometime, we'll show you the rest. We were, we were talking that we, you know, um, we would love to have people out but because of everything that is going on. I think it, uh, if you felt you really wanted to come out and, and look at the studio, if we did social distancing, everybody wore a mask, we might be able to arrange something. But I understand that it's very difficult in these times. So we, well, that's yeah. where we'll leave it. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Well, let's hope. Let's hope next year. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> anything, cross everything. Yeah. So, so next month, Bridget, Richard is going to show us how to create a studio in very small space. <laughs> wow. And, wow. Very good. And then, how to um, decorate her extravagant cups. The following month, hopefully it will be cool and John Nelson will build a fire and do horse hair firing. Yay. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So that will be November. 
If you all are interested in doing a demonstration or sponsoring a program for the group, be sure and get in touch with me. And this is Jill talking. Yeah, thank you so much, Jill, too. People, Jill, I want to say something about Jill, too. Jill works so hard for the does. guild, and she basically has helped keep it together through all this. So we want to thank her, too, very much. Thank you, Jill. You're welcome. The Thank way you, you can so help is by come cleaning out the glass studio. 